So in doing a month devoted entirely to horror, it was only a matter of time before we ended up at evil puppets. Uh, whether it be um, actual, like, possessed puppets, or are they or are they not evil and alive, or are they just part of their owner's personality sort of thing. Uh, regardless, I figured these were com comparable enough uh, to at least fit this whole format anyway, so uh, since we're going to do one at a time anyway, and uh, I think we're going to start with Dead Silence. Um, <laughs> so in 2004, Saw came out, of course, uh, which was James Wan's, James Wan, I believe, his first movie, and uh, Lee Wan out wrote that. And they were this teaming that we were going to see uh, together, obviously, for quite some time, all the way uh, forward into Insidious and all that. Lee Wan kind of played a part in Death Sentence as well uh, in Wan's filmography. But then, um, before they really took off, and then before Wan ended up doing like The Conjuring and Lee Wan went off and is eventually finding his way doing stuff like Upgrade. Um, they had to follow Saw up with something, <laughs> and a lot of people were highly anticipating what that would be. And if there's one thing I remember about Dead Silence when it came out, it's that nobody was happy with what that follow-up was. <laughs> we actually had a uh, friend who was like a huge uh, horror fan, and we caught him coming out of the theater. We were there to see something else, and he had just seen Dead Silence, and we were like, so how was it? And he just very bluntly like, dude, it sucks. And he's, he's not usually the type to just flat out say that about a movie, so there was something horribly off about Dead Silence the scene before we went in, on top of all the other bad word you hear. Um, and I remember watching it when it... I never saw it in theaters eventually. I, I had to see it when it came out on DVD, but I do remember thinking that it, was st it still had that James Wan atmosphere of sorts, um, which obviously I wasn't as familiar with now, or then as I am now. Um, because when you look at the opening scene of Dead Silence, when they, the opening when uh, Ryan Quan's wife is killed before he goes into the whole investigation of that, it's like, it doesn't, so, I mean, you can tell that it's a Wan movie if you're aware of it, but if you're not aware that it's a James Wan movie, it seems like it, nowadays it comes off as like a knockoff of one of his movies. Like, if you were to not know when this came out or who did it, you would think that it was like, post Insidious or post The Conjuring or whatever, and it was somebody, like, badly copying Juan. Um, but no, it's him. It's him just sort of finding his... What I'm, and the interesting thing about that, too, is, like, it's almost like it's the start of something that would be great. It just happens to suck, because when you look at Saw, you don't completely get the vibe uh, that this guy would go on to do, like, Insidious and The Conjuring when you look at the style of it. In Dead Silence, you can tell this was, like, the start of him finding that ground that he wanted to be in and that certain very recognizable style that he has. And there, there is one, like, really great shot in this opening when he finds his wife's body and, like, the mouth is torn down and the tongue is out and all that. And the way it zooms out and then this zoom out, uh, the image is inside his eye and then we zoom all the way out into another scene uh, through that image. And that's, like, that's the kind of stuff that he would go on to do, and, like, in good movies. <laughs> um, so there was definitely, you could tell it was the start of something. Um, but I think the quality of the movie itself kind of made people a bit wary of it before we eventually found that he is extremely talented and one of the best uh, that the horror genre has, even if he's going on to, like, Aquaman and stuff like that, or Furious 7 still. Um, hor horror is clearly where his heart is, but... Um, it, it, you could also tell it's almost like they were, they were kind of a little afraid to branch out because they've got like, um, obviously the puppet's name is Billy. It, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Um, and then they've got like Donnie Wahlberg playing a detective, and it's like, wow, they just really don't want to get away from Saul, do they? <laughs> um, so they are slowly going that direction. It is worth noting that. Um, Death Sentence was the same year as this. I think, I'm thinking, I actually I can't remember which one came out first, but being around the same time, it does make, I almost want to give him the benefit of the doubt and say maybe his heart wasn't, because Death Sentence is like so well made and such a better movie, it almost makes you think maybe he had his heart in that more that year, and that's why Dead Silence feels a little bit, but then that doesn't really explain where Lee else coming from, because he wrote the thing, and that's, there's just as many problems lie there, so, um, it's, but yeah, I do wonder if maybe it's just, 
maybe he was more focused on making one movie better than the other, because Death Sentence is also, like, not just is it, like, this great suspense movie and this big sort of, with this big sort of action climax, but it's got so much heart and emotion in it, too. It's, like, it's a movie that you would really have to focus on. It's got that amazing chase sequence in it. And it's, like, if he was just sort of half-assing Dead Silence on the side, it sort of makes sense how Dead Silence turned out the way that it did. Um... But that's not to say that it doesn't have, like, some decent quality stuff in it. Like, I was talking about that opening shot. Um, but there's also some things in it that, you know, show promise for something that this could have been. Uh, like I said, I don't know that it was completely... That could have been completely saved without going back to the script. Um, but when you look at stuff... like One thing I kind of appreciate is um, the fact that Ryan Quanon's character, the main character here, is, like, alone. Because when you see these horror movies and it goes into those cliches of he's got to investigate, he's got to find out the backstory of the spirit and all that stuff, how it connects to him and all that, it's usually one, it's like the protagonist and then a boyfriend or girlfriend or a friend or an expert or somebody, and there's always somebody there that they kind of like do half ass dialogue with or whatever, and they do all the investigating together, they crack jokes or whatever the hell. Um, but, like, there's, like, a kind of a creepy factor that this guy is pretty much in this mission by himself. Like, when he goes to investigate the cemetery and, you know, bury the puppet, uh, he's by himself. When he's investigating the theater, uh, or in that early scene, before he goes there with Donnie Wahlberg, um, there, obviously Donnie Wahlberg keeps coming in and out of this, but, I mean, for the most part, the protagonist is, like, alone, in all of this, and I always, that, that's kind of something I'd kind of like to see more of in movies like this, because like I said, when you don't have, like, somebody to constantly bounce off or whatever, or somebody that, like, has your back or whatever, or somebody that's there basically just to die so you don't, um, when you don't have that, um, it definitely adds another nice quality to the movie that sort of makes it a bit more isolating and creepy in those moments. Um, so I did like that they took that approach. Um, and then, of course, we have, um, I, I think one problem this movie has, like, one of the big problems is the fact that, uh, the, really just when it comes down to is that the dummy isn't that scary, and neither are any of the other ones. It's like, you can tell they kind of fear that the dummies weren't going to be scary, because they eventually resort to making one a clown. <laughs> it's, it's like, well, if they don't find those scary, everybody thinks clowns are scary, so we'll just do that. I do think the scarier antagonist of the movie is the person that is possessing the dummies, who we don't see near as much as the dummies, which is the issue. Uh, and that is this woman, Mary Shaw, who is, like I said, they sort of, he loves referencing his own movies so much. Obviously, when Death Sentence did come out, the same actress was playing the judge, and her name is Judge Shaw. Uh, so it's, who, who is amazing, by the way, she was like, um, who was it? She, most recently, she was Walking Phoenix's mom, and, uh, You Were Never Really Here, and, uh, something else, uh, that I had in my head, and now it's gone. But she was, but she's a definitely a notable actress, and she does bring like a real. She's got, she's got, she really works that scary face really well, especially when it's like all made up and stuff. Um, and that's when the scary factor kind of really comes in. But even then, it's sort of like I don't know if the tongue thing fully works. Uh, it does, it, like it looks maybe a little too silly, and it's that's sort of the key factor here. Is like even when you have like. Because Juan is able to do that. Like, there are some things he's done that, like, are silly on paper, like Lipstick Face and Insidious, but it's like, he finds a way to make it work, usually. Um, but here, it's like, I just don't know. I think it just comes back to the material. Uh, and it's like, there's only so much you can do with it. Um, so, that's the problem. And I think another thing here that they could have done is um, the, the, the idea that the reason he's alone for most of the movie is that because his wife is dead and she's killed in the first scene. And so there's like this short period where it's like, there's not like a whole lot of grieving when this happens. Uh, it sort of just goes right into the, now I gotta find out why this happened and what all this was and what this damn puppet is and all that. But it's like, I feel like it probably could have done something to deal with that grief more. And I, you may wonder why a movie like Dead Silence would need that, but... When you see movies coming out like Hereditary, I think that kind of spells it out pretty clearly. Where, like, the more real the emotion feels, it's like, there's a lot more likely of a chance that the horror is going to feel more real also. Um, that's why, like, these horror movies that, like, actually have a heart in the middle of them usually end up being the scarier ones. Because they're, they're kind of working all the emotions at once and kind of getting you high on that. So that when they hit you with the horror, you're, like, already vulnerable. 
Um, but they just kind of gloss over it. Like, the only reason, the only good thing that comes out of the fact that this movie begins with his wife dying is we get some cool cemetery shots. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's about it. Um, which, you know, is fine and all that, but, um, but yeah, this, this does go into most of the cliches that we already know. Like I said, the Donnie Wahlberg cop that keeps sort of popping, like, he just seems to materialize anywhere conveniently. Um, every now and then he's got, like, um a funny line here and there or something. Uh, there's something about, um, he describes the dummy and he's saying, like, you know, he gives a description. He's like, possibly has somebody's hand up his ass, stuff like that. Um, when Ryan Wan's getting away and he's running off to do something and he says, like, you know, don't make me chase you. I don't have a full tank of gas. You know, just, just stuff like that is, uh, fine. Uh, and he sells it enough. But it still feels like it's kind of a useless character overall, and it's really just there to sort of, like... Like I said, it kind of messes up that vibe I really like, where it's just him doing it by himself. Um, but but Wahlberg does what he can with it, so that's appreciated. Um, and then every now and then there's a decent thing, but they don't seem to fully deliver on it like they could. Like, uh, like when they do the flashback uh, to Marishaw's backstory with uh, Michael and all that. Uh, when she's doing the show, and it's like, when this flashback starts, it looks like it's on, like, a really old-timey film, and there's something, like, really cool and creepy about that, and just when you're like, ooh, that's cool and creepy, it, just, it dissolves, and it's just normal when we see the flashback. Um, I, I mean, I, maybe it would have been overkill because the flashback is so long that it probably would have looked weird after a while to do the old-timey film thing the whole time, but um, it felt like it promised something, and then it just kind of took it away from us, so that kind of sucked. Um, and then it's like, we go through this whole flashback, and just when we feel like it's getting, like, really good, and we're getting to something, we're actually getting to something, uh, it just ends, and we fill on the blanks later. Uh, it, I mean, it does kind of pay off when we see, uh, a dead child being used as a puppet, uh, which is something that's pretty wicked in a movie that's mainstream, especially at the time that it came out. Um, so that, I mean, that's, I guess that's a big enough payoff. That's probably one of the freakiest decisions they made. But overall, though, um, as far as, like, the rest of the scares go, there is, there's some stuff that I really wish that I liked that I kind of don't. And that is, um, some of these really good horror movies, even some of the not-so-great ones, will have, it like, this middle segment. The really good ones have, like, a lot of these, like the Conjuring movies, but when you get stuff like, uh... I think the stuff like The Woman in Black with Daniel Radcliffe, where even if the movie isn't that great, it'll at least have, like, this really awesome centerpiece, where it's just, like, this really long scene that really builds up and just gets scarier and scarier as it goes. Um, and the problem is, is that this this movie has scenes like that. Like, I'm thinking about when the, when the mortician, his death scene... How it seems like it's sort of building, um, but like I said, there's nothing particularly built up or scary about it. So instead of feeling like a long scene that's got all these scares in it and all this build up, it just feels like a long scene. And that's it. It just feels like a long scene. And then it just happens to end with his death. <laughs> um, that sucks where it's like you can see the layout for something good. Um, but it just kind of doesn't deliver. That's just it's basically the movie's forte. It's like, we'll show you what could be good, but we're not going to do that. Uh, you just have to imagine what this could have been. But like I said, even with the concept and the writing, it's still, it would have taken a lot to fix this. And it would have had to have been before, you know, cameras rolled. So that's, that's, that kind of sucks. But, uh, and then lastly, of course, uh, we're leaning, uh, towards this, as we're leaning towards the climax, uh, we got a nice big twist on our hands. And it's like the way this twist is revealed. I remember being like, uh, that's, that's basically what I took away from the movie. It's like the one aspect I remembered for the longest time uh, after I had first seen it. Uh, and I didn't see it again for like years. I don't even remember why I revisited it. But um, but still, I mean, it is like... Obviously, you, they you can tell that they kind of set it up uh, in an interesting way. Like, when you go back and watch the Bob Gunn scenes again, once you know the twist, it's sort of like... You know, you can see, like, the way his his demeanor seems to, like, change, or, like, when he, the first time, it's like, it's sort of one of those things that you can if you didn't catch the twist, if, if you say that you knew the twist, I believe you, but, um, if you didn't know, um, and you go back and you watch, like, the very first scene, 
when she like lays him back and takes his mask off. And it's like he looks so fucking dead. I can't believe we didn't know right away. <laughs> um, but the fact that the movie like did that, like they, it didn't feel like they really cheated. They did their best to kind of give us those clues. Like does not does this dude not look like a fucking corpse? Um, but then you like look at it and it seems very like. Uh, like, exactly how did she pull that up? Because, like, obviously in the scenes where Bob Gunn's talking, it's, like, the way his eyebrows move and, like, the very specific, you know, expressions that he has. It's, like, it's it's clear they're stretching it a little bit. Um, but it's, like, I mean, I guess they, they had to do it enough to where it wouldn't be completely given away if you had, like, Gunn just talking like a dummy, obviously. You would know instantly, but... Still, um, and then just sort of the reveal of it, where we see, like, what happens when he eats, and it's, and it gets, like, really fucking sick and twisted, and you just kind of admire it anyway, even if it's, like, a thing, and like I said, they keep throwing those clues at you, like, um, like, some of his dialogue is really stilted, like, when he says, like, you know, as your father, and then he says something, and it's like, who says that, and it's like, oh, yeah, if somebody was just puppeting him, that's probably how they would make him speak, that's probably what it would come off as, um, and he's saying, like, you know, oh, my father's changed since he met you, Amber Villa, and stuff like that. And it's like, it, it, the, it, it makes a lot of sense in the fact that they put that stuff in there and weren't afraid that it would be revealed early. But like I said, if, if people did figure it out early, that's, I, I wouldn't be surprised. But I, it's not something that I saw coming the first time I saw it, that's for sure. So, uh, yeah, um, so that's pretty much what the movie is it like i said it you can definitely it's so interesting to see a movie that's so hated from a director that's so beloved in this genre and to see like what would become of his movies in this one uh like in appearance and style and all that and it's like you can really see him kind of trying to find himself but like i said he was since he was also doing death sentence pretty much at the same time it's like it's easy to see how one probably got more care than the other but um and he probably made the right choice too but um, still, it, like, it does seem like it has a lot of promises that it doesn't deliver on, and that's really where its main problem is. Like I said, on top of the fact that it just kind of has a, a not-so-scary poster child that's most of the scares where the dummy's here, then he's there, and it's like, eh, I don't, <laughs> um, and, but yeah, but there's still, you know, enough to admire here, at least from, like, a technical standpoint to an extent, so... There's that. Uh, to go on to magic, though, we're going back a few decades to, like, 1978, I want to say. Um, and uh, this is a Richard Attenborough-directed movie where uh, with also um, a very memorably unnerving Jerry Goldsmith score. Um, a lot of stuff backing this uh, in the behind-the-scenes department, but on, on top of it, uh, we start off... It, it is a bit of a uh, sort of a slow-burn thing where we have... Uh, Anthony Hopkins playing this wannabe magician who's learning from his mentor, whose name is actually Merlin, uh, which people understandably scoff at when they hear it. Um, and we meet, like, his agent, who is uh, the perfectly cast Burgess Meredith, who just has that perfect kind of sleazy agent way about him. Um, especially those line deliveries in the first scene with David Ogden Stiers are just perfect to set up that character. Um, and then we get the fact that um, Anthony Hopkins is playing our main character. And uh, it's some people say that they see, like, you know, er, er, like almost early footage of uh, Hannibal Lecter inside him. I don't know. I feel like the character is totally different. Even, even the tiny little ticks, I think this character is on a whole different thing. I think people just see Anthony Hopkins in a horror movie and automatically assume Hannibal Lecter's probably in there somewhere. But this is kind of a whole different thing where... Um, He's got, like, he's got, like, an oddness about him that's kind of off-putting, but at the same time, there's, like, this sort of tragic air that he finds, uh, which, not just necessarily in the direction the story goes, but just sort of in general. Um, there's just something about this dude where you feel like, you feel like he's, the person he's become is not, like, this was not his intention to become this person that he is. Um, he's just kind of inherently off the wall. There's even the, the moment at the beginning where we, like, immediately know when, uh, they're talking about him getting a particular job, but he's like, I can't, I can't do that because they're going to do, like, a mental assessment, and I can't have a mental assessment done because they're going to lock me the fuck up. <laughs> so, with that being, like, our intro, before he goes off, uh, in isolation, more or less, to back to Anne-Margaret, 
um, there, there's definitely something there that he has to balance a lot, and I do think that he uh, does it very well, because I think there was criticism in his casting at the time, and some people thought his performance was a bit dull or whatever, especially when you look at the fact that apparently Attenborough wanted uh, Gene Wilder to play the part, and I guess later on Gene Wilder actually said that he really wanted the part too, and they both agreed that they thought a comedic actor would have been better and would have had much more of that sort of stage presence and sort of the manic way about them. Um, and it would have been, like, a bigger deal when they went into their more dramatic side. Uh, but I think it was the producer that stepped in and said they needed a serious actor because they didn't want a comedic actor to distract from how heavy of, like, a drama this is underneath the sort of, well, I guess over the horror aspect that's under it. Um, and I, I get the Wilder thing. I would have really liked to see that. Um, and I think it says something that both he and Amber agreed on that. Um, but I definitely see where the producer's coming from. To where that probably... Like, I think I think Wilder could have pulled this off. And I think comedic actors could have pulled that off. Um, it was probably... I don't know if it maybe was less of a thing in 1978 to see, like... Like, this was before... Like, nowadays we've got, like, Robin Williams and Jim Carrey to point fingers at, but it's like, back then, I'm not sure if it was, like, as much of a bankable thing to have a comedic actor go in that direction. Um, but... But, yeah, I do see where the producer is coming from, and I do think that uh, Hopkins really sort of made it his own in a, a big way. Especially when you get scenes when, like, he's really good at ramping up the tension by himself, where he had... Well, Anne, Anne Margaret's not to be, you know, thrown away here. She, the way she bounces off of him definitely plays a big part in how how tense the scenes get. Um, but the thing here is, like, like the scene when um, he's first trying the magic trick with her, and he's, like, desperate not to fail, and he's getting more and more tense as he can't figure it out and he can't get it, and he's getting more irate towards her for not concentrating hard enough, uh, which is key in this trick, apparently. And it's like the way this is shot, too, where it cuts to her. It's cutting back and forth, and when it cuts to her, she's, like, kind of well-lit. Like, all the light is here, we can see her face and all that. And when it would cut back to Hopkins, he's, like, he's like shrouded in shadows. And it's, like, just cutting back and forth between that and seeing that difference. And just really, in the way his, he's getting more and more tense as it goes, uh, makes for a really good scene and a really sort of tense thing where it sort of shows off his unpredictable nature uh, exactly because we're not quite sure exactly what direction this guy is going to go in. Um, and so, ev and everything I've mentioned so far has not even mentioned Fats yet. Uh, the dummy that he has, like, basically... If for the first time I saw the movie, I almost couldn't believe that that was Hawkins actually doing the voice as well. It sounded so different. Uh, but the interesting thing about that, and it really kind of plays in with the theme also, is um, I feel like when he's on the stage and he's performing, um, it's like a whole different voice. Like, it's bigger, it sounds so much less like Hawkins. But then when, like, they're not on stage and they're just talking to each other, like, you know, at home or whatever, um, it sounds a lot more like Hawkins. Like, it's really died down and it's much more like, like Corky's personalities are like starting to mesh and it's starting to become apparent that these two minds are the same regardless of what you may or may not believe about the dummy when you go into it um and he did like uh hopkins learned like the whole voice throwing thing and he learned like the card tricks and stuff like that and apparently in regards to the dummy itself obviously it's made up to look like him which is kind of funny but um it's also a, i heard somewhere this almost sounds like one of those urban legend things but um i think I, i've seen more than one source cited I, I don't know that i've heard hawkins say it himself but apparently the story is is that once they made the dummy they let hawkins take it like take it home and practice with it and he basically called up like the producers or whoever and said um i'm creeped out get this dummy the hell out of my house uh and At attenborough like had to go to his house and like calm him down like i said that sounds like it could be one of those urban legend things but i don't know it's kind of believable too so it's probably a bit more jarring too that it kind of looks like him especially in that scene at the end um when it pans up when he's like up against the wall and he's got the knife and it pans up uh and you've got that harmonica score going um, I think it's intentional how much he does look like the dummy in that shot, um, especially with the personalities becoming more and more together. 
Um, it is also worth noting that, um, actually it's probably pretty clear that apparently Fats was the inspiration for Al Stein uh, when he came up with his slappy character in the Goosebumps books, which is interestingly timed since we're talking about Goosebumps a lot lately. Um, so, yes, but then, obviously, there's the whole thing about, uh, is, you, there's the kind of, the kind of debate, I mean, I think for the most part, it's pretty much played up as nothing more than a psychological thing, but there is debate still about whether or not Fats is, like, an actual evil entity or not, um, and there is one scene, there is one scene that really sh sh throws ambiguity into that, but the first thing I wanted to talk about was, uh, the way it plays this up for a while, when we're not, when we really just sort of see him as a dummy at first, but then uh, it gets to the sex scene uh, with Hopkins and Margaret, and it's cutting back and forth. Like I said, that whole monologue score is like really amping up, uh, and we're cutting back and forth between them and Fats just sitting on the couch blankly, and it's like with each of those cuts and with the score getting bigger and bigger and the cuts getting like shorter and all that, like it's building to something. I love how much, like, even if you totally just take it as, like, a psychological thing, you're, like, on the edge of your damn seat waiting for that fucker to move because whenever it cuts back to him. Uh, and you just keep waiting for that, and it just you just sort of keep anticipating it. Um, and, like, the longer it lingers, uh, the more you just think that's going to happen. And, so, and they also kind of use that technique, um, not so with Fats, like, after he has supposedly killed Burgess Meredith, um, and he's dragging him out into the water and stuff like that, and the way it, like, cuts to the different parts, like, it cuts to his hands floating in the water, and then it cuts to, like, close-ups of his face, and it's, like, the whole time you're anticipating that he's not dead and that he's gonna wake up, and unlike the fat scenario, you get a payoff, he actually does, um, which makes it even more tense when we do get the payoff to that similar setup. It's so where it's like, now you definitely get the sense that Fats could come alive at any minute if the camera lingers on him long enough. Um, so you get stuff like, um, and so, and obviously also uh, some of these things where, another aspect I didn't think, I didn't mention with the Hawkins' performance that I love as a Burgess Meredith scene as well is the uh, make Fats shut up for five minutes scene. And it's like, you can tell that it's getting closer and closer to what we're expecting when he says, like, he's keeping the time, and then Hawkins just kind of sits there and he's like, obviously I can do this. And then he's like, how long has it been? And Meredith's like, 30 seconds. And it's like, you can tell the length of it. It's like, I don't think there's even a break in time there. Like, we as an audience kind of know it's only 30 seconds when he asks that. Um, and then just the way, like, he wears down... Where he's like, you know, this is cruel, I'm never going to forgive you for this, and like that. It's like, he's so eerily calm. It is so creepy how calm he is. <laughs> Despite the fact that he's getting he's getting closer and closer to breaking. And Fat's returning. Um, and, uh, and there's also uh, tense scenes that, um, don't, like, a lot of them don't involve the dummy. Like the boat scene. Uh, when he's out there with Duke, and it's like... What's interesting about that is it's like the way the different things raise tension. Like, when it starts off, obviously, it's Duke confronting him about banging Anne Margaret the night before. Um, and that confrontation alone makes the scene feel very tense. Uh, but then just when you think that tensity is enough, uh, they add the tension of, oh shit, he's about to find Bruce Meredith's body. And it's like when he sees something and there's just that anticipation... Um, and then it's like a fake out, and then they just unceremoniously, oh, he's on the shore. <laughs> but but the tension is definitely there before they find him, uh, which is great. Um, and so, yes, as I said, there's definitely um, a whole... You can have sort of a debate about whether or not um, Fats actually has, like, his own life, more or less. And I love the fact that they only chose... They only pick one moment... Like, they're like, if we're going to make bring some ambiguity to this, it's going to be one moment that's really fast. And it's it's pretty noticeable, but um, at the very end, when they're, like, arguing, and it's getting really out of hand, and Hawkins is, like, really losing it, and, like, he's mo making him move and all that, his eyes are moving, his ears are moving, his head's moving and all that, and then he takes his hand out and he sets him down and he gets up off the couch and he's still moving for like a second. His eyes are still moving, and, and then he's and then it cuts away. And that's the only time I think that happens. Um, I think 
and this might seem like a bit of a cop out. I do think it's like it's more of a symbolic thing, uh, because it's getting more and more amped up in the tension as it goes. Uh, and this scene's getting really, really big, and it's like it's one of those things where the scene is so tense that maybe why it's in there because you're you're less likely to see it there than you are in another scene because it just all happens so fast and things are getting so out of hand. Um, but it's definitely there. Um, but I do think it's probably more of a symbolic thing um, about how the fat's personality of him is getting so out of control it is starting to take on a life of its own. But uh, overall, obviously, it's brings us to this ending that, uh, it's, I, like I said, I do like that it's, like, we've got a love story going on here, and we've got the whole, he's, like, so mentally off story, and then it becomes kind of a horror story, but, like, really at its core, it's, it's a tragedy about this dude, uh, that just has this problem. Like I said, it, it feels a lot like this is not the dude that he wanted to become, and then when he takes care of that in the final scene, um, it's just, like I said, it really just ends on this tragic note that's really kind of the the note that you kind of, and the feeling you kind of really take with you once it's over. Uh, and kind of makes it this whole other thing once it ends. And then, even though, like I said, you can pretty much feel that without with this character if you, if that's the direction you take it. But, uh, but then there is that final moment where Anne Margaret does, like, her own puppet voice just before it cuts. I'm not sure what that's supposed to be, but, um... But it is this, it is kind of this nice little, uh, punctuated ending, so, uh, yeah, so that's, that's how I see magic anyway. Um, I think this is the part where I choose between the two. I don't really think that's necessary right now. I think it's pretty clear that one of these is significantly better than the other. Um, and of course it's the one that's, you know, maybe a bit more philosophical about its concept as opposed to just being a... A possessed dummy movie and all that, but, um, it, so it's really, like, in different contexts, it really just depends, but, um, so, like, in, in, in a way, it's probably an unfair comparison, but, I mean, I'm not sure what many things like Dead Science you can put it up against to where it's like, oh, this is, you know, significantly better, maybe, like, you know, the old, some of the later Puppet Master movies or something, I don't know, but, um, that's, I think, where I'm going to leave this, so, uh, the next one, we're going to stick with Anthony Hopkins uh, and go in a video a video that me and my brother shot two months ago. Uh, and then one more of these on Halloween itself. Uh, the day of Halloween, not the Halloween series. Uh, and then that'll be it for this month. So, uh, yeah. So until all that stuff.